Not long ago, we saw the first six elemental types in Pokémon. So let's return to our investigation with even more of them. Hello there, Professor Fern here. Last time we had a look at some of the fascinating elemental properties we often assign to Pokémon, and today we will continue our journey into their study. Since last time I've kept going with my research. And based on it we've brought you the next six elemental Pokémon types, their biological and ecological implications, and how they could possibly work. Please consider liking and subscribing to boost this video's stats. And now, without further ado, let's take a look at the first of today's types, Fire. While Fire-type Pokémon can be found across all kinds of ecosystems, they are known to thrive in arid environments, including deserts, savannas, and even volcanic regions. Their elemental classification comes from their ability to harness the power of heat and fire as a defensive and offensive tool, and the mechanisms used for this purpose are almost as varied as fire types themselves, including many types of exothermic or inflammable chemical reactions and ignition of gases or materials, either produced inside their bodies or present in their environment. Other fire types will have metal particles concentrated in, for example, claws and quills and these metal particles can be quickly heated through vibration of the surrounding muscles or through chemical reactions. The applications of these tools are just as varied, with all sorts of fire types using them as mating and territorial displays or for intraspecies fighting. Predators will also use fire to injure prey and then track it down as it dies, similar to many venomous snakes, or to ignite the vegetation in order to set traps for prey while others will use these same abilities to drive away their own predators. It should be noted, since the bodies of these Pokémon are adapted to resisting this same element, predation of fire types by other fire types is rare, and intraspecies fighting tends to be non-lethal. These weapons, similarly, are less effective when used on Pokémon capable of escaping into the water, as well as those covered in hard armors that don't conduct heat. Smaller animals, as well as those covered in conductive armor, like steel types, will be much more likely prey for them. Let's go on to a much more extended type, poison. Every kingdom of life, including animals, plants, fungi, algae and bacteria, has evolved compounds capable of harming other organisms and this is the realm of the poison type. They strike at prey and predators by using all kinds of venoms, poisons, toxins and other harmful compounds, and even, as we've come to learn recently, radiation, although this is not as common. The mechanisms poison types have evolved to use these toxins are extremely diverse, including stingers, claws, specialist fangs and quills, or even simply shooting said toxins at other animals. The effectiveness of this mighty weapon, of course, depends heavily on the organism being able to deliver it to its target, meaning toxin-wielding Pokémon may struggle when dealing with animals equipped with hard defenses and other barriers the fangs cannot penetrate, as well as those who use their own sneakiness or brains to catch poison types off guard, bypassing and avoiding their deadly toxins. Now we shall see a deceptively simple type, normal type. Ah yes, good old normal type, the bane of my existence as a researcher. While I am forced to follow the scientific consensus of this being a type, I cannot help feeling normal type has been made into a sort of catch-all category, made to include everything they couldn't fit in any other. Normal type primarily contains vertebrates that lack any of the elemental properties of other types, relying instead on the properties and abilities considered, so to speak, baseline in this kind of animal, including claws, teeth, horns, etc. 
and how simple things would be if this was the end of it. But alas, it is not. Normal type also seems to include organisms with a very high degree of adaptability. As if normal was the point from which all other types originate. These highly adaptable Pokémon are able not only to thrive on different ecosystems, but also to adapt their physical appearance and abilities to them, and even reverse the process afterwards. Some Pokémon traditionally considered as normal types can, for example, begin their life cycle as such and then grow to display abilities from other types, with even members of the same litter growing into different types of adults. This hints at this Pokémon having a high degree of phenotypic plasticity and adaptive biochemistry, which is not exclusive to the normal type, but tends to be most dramatic in many Pokémon classified as such. As fun as that was, let's move on to Ice type. These Pokémon live in cold regions, and are usually equipped with four, blubber or anti-freeze cellular mechanisms, like those seen in some species of frog, all of which help them resist the cold around them. However, their typing does not come exclusively from their habitat, as they also use the power of the cold itself to survive. These animals hunt and protect themselves from others by blowing colder and using endothermic reactions which absorb the energy from their surroundings and effectively cool down anything they come in contact with to lower the temperature of their target. Even with animals adapted to this cold, this loss of body temperature can be very dangerous. Aside from their offensive use, these same endothermic reactions can be used to cool down water in order to precipitate its freezing point, a useful tool in the building of their shelters. Interestingly, use of these weapons can also cause condensation of vapor in the air, creating a fine mist which can produce aurora borealis-like effects through light refraction, which can deter, confuse or scare away predators. Unfortunately, in a case of over-specialization, ice-type Pokémon often find themselves limited to their cold habitats, which shrink and grow with the passing of the seasons. When out of these environments, the adaptations that help them survive the cold risk overheating their bodies, and their weapons turn out rather ineffective against most predators. From here on, we will see two types that were quite fun to figure out, beginning with Fairy Type, the newest type added to the games. One of the most noticeable aspects of this type is the way fairy types help other Pokémon through boosts or preventing stat changes, which indicates they must be mutualistic symbionts, either on a long-term or short-term basis. They produce chemical compounds that boost the immune system of their host and help take care of parasites and diseases, with the fairy type itself receiving, depending on the species, protection from predators or access to better sources of food. However, not all is wholesome in this type, as indicated by their devious appearance and sinister cuteness, as their sweet smells, bright pink colorations and showy ornaments can be utilized to attract the attention of potential predators, forcing such a symbiosis on them. Many fairy types adapted to this lifestyle will weaponize their chemical compounds, releasing them through volatile fur and feathers, or as secretions sprayed into the air, using them to alter the host's emotional state, making it more docile, or confusing it in order to stop it from harming the fairy type itself. While many fairy types tend towards smaller sizes, larger species do exist. These do not attach to a host, but will use similar compounds to alter the environment inducing the production of more food on the plants around them, or sedating predators to stop them from representing a danger to them. And last but not least, here's the Psychic type, which encapsulates Pokémon with abilities that seem to align with traditional views of psychic powers including both the ability to affect the mind of other animals and the capacity to, to a certain degree, 
alter the physical world around them purely through the use of their mind. The first of these can partially be done through strategic thinking and the use of tricks, as well as taking advantage of changing colors and reflecting light, famously used by animals like cuttlefish and stoats, in order to confuse other animals and place them in a state that allows psychic Pokémon, as predators, to strike, and as prey, to escape unharmed. The second part of this, however, is much more complex. Many psychic types have developed an organ, similar in a way to the melon of cetaceans, which contains metallic particles ingested by the Pokémon, as well as a saline medium. This work at creating an approximation of a biological battery, which can produce a magnetic field at will. Depending on the strength of the field generated, it can affect the senses and physiology of other organisms or even prevent them from moving properly. The psychic organ, of course, is isolated through a dense layer of fat to avoid affecting the user. Many of these Pokémon also have a greater brain compared to their total body mass, as is necessary to use these abilities, and show a high degree of intelligence expressed to great problem-solving abilities and situational adaptability. Their abilities make them great at hunting a wide diversity of prey, but many are specialized in finding ways to circumvent the defenses of venomous creatures, as well as prey with more physical defensive strategies. Their effectiveness, however, falls down when facing equally smart creatures, and particularly aggressive or sneaky predators can easily get the best out of them. And that's it for Speculative Biology look into some new Pokémon types. I'm glad to see you here, back for more of this project that I've been very interested in continuing. Not many notes this time, as the individual Pokémon we saw today will in time have their own shorts explaining the details of their biology, so stay posted for that. I hope you'll like this episode, and please tell me down there which of these Pokémon was your favorite and which type we haven't seen yet you are most excited for. Ever since part 1, a lot of people asked for a continuation, so here's a thank you to all of you. And also, thank you to our researchers and research associates who support us through Patreon and YouTube memberships, and especially to our new member, Space Boys. Thanks for joining! Remember to join in too if you want to help support the channel, see all of our creatures and videos ahead of time, or help us mold them into shape. Or you can also like, subscribe, or write a comment telling me any type of creature you would like me to give the Speckivo treatment in the show, as any of those really help the channel a lot. Thank you all for watching, and see you next time on the Speculative Wildlife Research Center.